All right. <clears throat> Everybody see me okay down here? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, <clears throat> the other day, we'll get the picture up here. It's coming. Uh, that's not it. <laughs> Still the same. <laughs> that time it wasn't me. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> as time goes on, we're going to have better, you know, projection and better computer systems and, and things like that, you know. But uh, can you uh, <clears throat> can you clear the the words for a second? Okay. Because uh, I'm hoping that the the picture shows up at the parts that I wanted to share with you. But I was riding down the road uh, the other the other week, and uh, this is a pretty nice road. It's called Overlook Road, and it kind of is like a detour down there off of Indian Rock here where the bridge is being repaired. And I was going down through there and what I noticed was, uh, can you get a, the next picture? There it is. This farmer, when he planted these trees, I believe the farmer planted the trees on this road because you can see the, the trees on both sides of the road. And as you're going down through there, it looks pretty nice, you know. And uh, I don't, I'm not sure why he planted the trees there. You know, he could have planted them there because he wanted the road to look nice. It went back to his house, you know. Uh, he could have put the trees there to stop the wind from damaging his, his fields, you know. But one thing I noticed when I was going down the road is, if you can take notice, if I can hold this laser still enough, see how high the corn is here? And it kind of comes down and gets real low here and then comes back up, and it kind of is pretty low there, and then it comes up high here. Every one of them trees, uh, can you hit the next picture? We'll just like show different angles of that. But every one of those trees have uh, hindered the growth of these crops, right? So I guess you can flip to the next one. I tried to get enough angles that would show up on the screen. But the, the thing that started to rise up in my spirit was, some, you know, sometimes God will use nature to uh, reveal a message to you or reveal a message to share with others, you know. And, uh, you know, this can be applicable in my life. I've seen it applicable in my life. But there's things in our lives that we don't always see, you know, that hinders our spiritual growth. Some things we put in our lives intentionally. Some things we put... Some things are in our lives and we don't even realize it. And we don't really always realize how they affect our spiritual growth as an individual. And we don't always realize how they affect the spiritual growth of others around us. You know, so some things that we have in our life. So this tree could represent a lot of things. You know, this tree could represent uh, uh, withdrawing from Christian fellowship, you know. A lot of times people don't want to get involved in church because they, they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm the church, you know, and I don't need to go to church to be saved and things like that. And what it does is when, you, when you're not involved with a local body of believers, it could hinder other people's uh, growth at the church because you're not there to bless them and speak into their lives and, and you're not there to be spoken into, you know, the Word of God being shared with you. So you could be hindering your own growth, plus you could be hindering someone else's growth, you know. Coming to church isn't always about you, it's also about others, you know, because we, we make up a body. Uh, it could be neglect. Spiritual growth could be hindered because of our own neglect. Maybe we don't take time to do devotions, maybe we don't take time to read the Word, maybe we don't take time for fellowship. Uh, spiritual growth could be hindered by ungodly friendships, you know, hanging out with people that just don't acknowledge God and and you're not there to bring God to them, you know. And we, you just partake in their ways of the world. You know, it could hinder your growth and hinder their growth. 
uh, discouragement. There could have been something that happened to you at church years ago, and you just got discouraged and feel like you don't want to go back, you know. Uh, pride, you know. Sometimes we get, we get caught up in our own self-image, you know, and, and we, just, we just feel like, you know, well, I'm good enough, I don't got to go to church. You know, who are them people, you know, to speak to me and tell me what's right and wrong and things like that. So sometimes pride can damage uh, our spiritual growth. You know, uh, but the I think the the big the big one is is the lack of knowledge. You know, because all those things I just mentioned are affected by the lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding uh, the Word of God. So, uh, can you hit the next slide? Eventually, we're going to have everything hooked to our iPad, so we can just hit the button, and everything comes up in time. You know, let's go to the next one. But over the years, uh, we can just go to Hosea 4, 6 slide. Over the years, you know, doing ministry out in, in the community, uh, I've come to realize that there's at least three things that really affect people, right? One is the lack of knowledge. The other would be uh, not understanding salvation, what it, how to become born again and why you need to be born again. And then the other thing is not really understanding uh, who we are in Christ and the authority and power that we have over sin and its dominance in our life. So, uh, Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but the key is we're destroyed uh, for the lack of knowledge, Right? Uh, 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now that word uh, sober uh, means to kind of like be discreet, be calm, be, be collected in spirit. Uh, vigilant means be, wa be watch watchful, uh, pay strict attention to, Okay. So we got, we got to pay attention to the adversary. You know, he's roaring around. But the thing that we need to realize is it says that he roars around as a lion. It doesn't say that he is a lion. You know, uh, people think uh, movies and TV and the world blow up the devil to be this big, strong, powerful guy, you know, that has power over everything. But it says that he, he roars around as a lion, right? He was defeated at the cross. He has no teeth, right? Um, and he seeks whom he may devour. Okay, He doesn't devour anybody he chooses. He seeks who he may devour. And <clears throat> the reason why he devours people is because they have a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding of the Word of God to stand against his, decep his deception and his attacks against our lives. But one of the... the biggest things I'm amazed at is while we're out with, witnessing to people, there are people that sit in church for 30, 40 years and don't actually understand if they're saved or not. You know, you ask them, if you die today, would you go to heaven? And they'll say things like, I hope so. Or they'll say things, well, I went to church for 30 years, you know, or I've never hurt anybody or, you know, I've been a pretty good person, you know. And it's amazing how uh, common these, questions, these answers are within the church body. It's almost like they don't have confidence in knowing that they're saved, right? So one of the things I'd like to, to share about is a few scriptures to <coughs> explain why we need to be saved and how, uh, how to be saved, right? And some scriptures to show you that you can know that you can have a home in heaven, and 1 John 5, 11, 12, and 13, it says, This is the record that God has given unto us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son have life, and he that hath not the Son of God have not life. These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So 
there's three things here. One is this is God's record, and God can't lie. And he tells us that we can know that we can have eternal life. We can have a home in heaven. But the question becomes, why would we need the Son of God to have eternal life, right? And that's a good question. And, and you know, God gives us the answer to this question. In Romans 3.23, or Romans 3.10, it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says, <clears throat> for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That word all means all. That's you and I. And or, can you clear the, the words there for a minute? <clears throat> you talk a lot of people and, you know, you ask them if they, if, they're, if they can recognize the fact that they're a sinner. And they say, well, you know. I don't lie, I just, you know, I, I might tell little white lies, you know. But it's still a lie, right? Uh, I'll give you an example of that. This sign right here, this is out in North York, the Hardy dealers down here. This is the road that goes behind Ruck, the, the old wise. And this sign right here says, all uh, traffic must turn right, right? Well, they stuck that sign up, and I didn't realize they stuck it up. And I didn't see it, and I took a left turn. And regional pulled me over and gave me a ticket, right? So when I got that ticket, right, I didn't realize that I broke the law. But the cop didn't care. It, see, when we, when we sin, sin is against God, right? And he has the law. He has the Ten Commandments. And when we break them, it doesn't matter if we're guilty of intentionally breaking them. We've still broken them. When that cop pulled me over, I could tell him, you know, I didn't see it. You just stuck it up. Didn't matter to him. He gave me a ticket, right? I could have told him, hey, who are you to tell me I can't turn here? I pay, I pay my vehicle registration. I pay taxes. I can do what I want, right? That's like a direct rebellion, right? It, it doesn't matter. I still broke the law. So the cop was just, and he had to sentence me for my crime, right? Uh, Romans 6.23 tells us that uh, the wages of sin is death. So when you think about the, the word wage, right? We go to work to earn a wage, a paycheck at the end of the week. Our sin earns us a wage, and that wage is death. Now the word death in the scripture, uh, it's just not your physical body dying. It's an eternal separation from God. And Revelations uh 2014 references the second death, the lake of fire. And Jesus said there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? See, God is just, and our sin has to be dealt with, right? And the thing that we need to realize is that sin just doesn't affect our relationship. Like, say, say me and Jimmy are hanging out, and I lie to Jim, right? There becomes a death in our relationship because he can't trust me now. You know what I'm saying? If, if, if uh, me and Jack are hanging out and I steal something out of his garage or his shed, you know, and, and he finds out there becomes a death in our relationship because he can't trust me anymore, right? So not only does there become a death in our relationship between me and him, there becomes a death between me and God because sin has an effect. You know, when, uh, can you clear the words for a second there? That's Joseph. How many people remember the scripture, the, the Bible story about Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, and he says no. And he says, uh, how can I sin such a great sin against God? And he fled, right? See, Joseph realized that sin not only was going to affect him and Potiphar's relationship, and even her relationship with him, but it was also going to affect God's relationship with himself. So sin just doesn't affect me and your relationship, but affects God's relationship. Because he sees the grief and the harm that we've caused the other person. It grieves his heart. You know, that's why God gave us the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments isn't this set of rules that is God's made to dictate us and be this, this tyrant over us. The Ten Commandments were set up to benefit us in our lives, you know. So it's like a safeguard to live by, Right? Because he doesn't want to bring death in our fellowship. He doesn't want to see death in our fellowship. He wants to see life. He wants to see fellowship. He wants to see his kingdom advance, right? 
So can you bring those words back up? So we're told that uh, the gift of God, right, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, this religious system tries to teach us that somehow, and we're going to touch that in the scripture too, that we have to earn God's favor to have a relationship with Him, right? That somehow we have to do enough good things for God to accept us. And the problem is we keep falling short, so we continuously walk around in this condemnation that we don't feel worthy to have fellowship with God. We don't feel worthy to go to church. We don't feel worthy that someday we're going to go to heaven to be with God. Because we get hit, or when we sin, we get this hit with this condemnation. And the thing that we got to realize is it's the gift of God, right? Jesus Christ was the gift of God. And when you think about the word gift, okay, if I were to buy you a birthday present or uh, an anniversary gift, right, I worked, I went to work, I earned the money. I paid for the gift, right? The only thing you can do is receive it. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. The only thing you can do is receive it, right? And the scripture says that the gift of God is eternal life. We can't add anything to what Jesus Christ did on the cross. You know, Jesus said it's finished. He paid our sin debt in full. So if I die and I stand before God and God says, Aaron, why should I let you in my heaven? And I said, well, I went to church every Sunday. I set up evangelism tests every summer. You know, I uh, uh, volunteered to direct traffic for the CMA. Then somehow I'm, I'm earning God's favor, trying to earn God's favor. I'm trying to add to what Jesus Christ did. And uh, if you pull up the next scripture, uh, Romans 5, 8. God commendeth his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, can you clear that picture for a minute? See that cross? You know what that was? That was a tree, right? That God created. A tree he created, a tree he watered, right? A tree he grew, right? He grew it for us to have pleasure. A tree produces air, oxygen, so we can breathe, you know? He allowed man to cut down that tree to nail his own son to it. Think about that. That's how much he loves us, right? He sent his son to pay a debt that we could never pay. But yet the religious systems of the world want to try to insult him and add to what Christ did. We want to try to add our good works or good deeds to what Christ did. And we can't do that. That's like slapping him in the face. Because he paid our debt in full, right? So he can put the words back up, Artie. And he did that while we were yet sinners. Christ left the realm of heaven, came as a man, humbled himself as a man, knowing that we were going to nail him to a tree out of his love, his love for us, right? So Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for grace, you are saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, when you think about the word grace, right? Grace is a the divine influence upon your heart. It's God's influence upon your heart, right? It's also a form of being able to say unmerited favor. It's something that we don't deserve, right? So by grace, you're saved through faith. Your faith in what? Jesus Christ dying for your sin and God raising him from the dead because he defeated sin and death. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And that goes back to the fact that if I die and I stand before God and God says, Aaron, why should I let you in my kingdom? And I said, well, we started FBC, you know, five weeks ago. You know, so I go out here and I get killed on the way home. I'm standing before God and God says, why should I let you in my kingdom? I said, well, we started FBC like five weeks ago. 
You know, I, I, you know, I went to church for 20 years. I, I read your word. I prayed to you. It's like adding to what Christ did. It's something to boast about in a sense. God, look what I've done. You know, and that's what all the other religions of the world are set up to do for you to earn God's favor, right? That's what all the isms are about. Islam, Buddhism, all these things, Hinduism, it's all set up to somehow earn God's favor to get to heaven, right? Christianity, taught correctly, is the only religion in the world that God has done something for you, right? You don't have to earn His favor. He died in your place because He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He, he can't... He doesn't want you to have to try to work for it. He positioned you to have a relationship with Christ, with Him, right? So, uh, John 1, 12. So the question becomes, you know, it's a gift, right? Just like any other gift, we need to receive it. John 1, 12 says, As many as received Him... To them gave he the power, the power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, right? So when we receive Christ, when we receive the redemption, redemptive work that Christ has done for us, when we place our faith and trust in him, the scripture teaches that we become born into his family, right? Some translations translate uh, sons of God as children of God. But... What's happening in the spirit realm is you're becoming born into the family of God, right? And when you think about that, you know, you have a mother and a father, right? Positionally, they'll always be your mother and father. It, it really doesn't matter if you see them once a week, if you see them twice a week or three times a week. It doesn't matter if you go out to breakfast with them every day. It doesn't matter, you know, if you spend every holiday with them. It, it kinda, your, your relationship kind of fluctuates over the years, you know? Like, my daughter's 21 right now. I'm lucky if she returns my calls and texts me back, you know. I actually had the privilege of having breakfast with her yesterday morning when she got off work, third shift, you know. And, then, you know, I love my daughter. I love spending time with her, you know. Uh, that's because I'm her father. But if she doesn't make an effort to spend time with me, uh, it's, like, it's like I'm standing around always wanting to hang out with my daughter Right? Because I love her and I appreciate her and I want to see her do good in life. And she's just off in life doing her own things, not even really thinking about me. Right? And sometimes that's how we are as God's children. Right? We're just off in the world doing whatever we want, however we want, whenever we want. And God's up here and He's longing for His relationship with His, with his people, with His children, with His creation. You know? So sometimes spiritual growth is because we neglect developing a relationship with God, right? And I tell you, my heart grieves as a father that I can't spend more time with my daughter. And it's not like we have this bad relationship. You know, it's not like my daughter's angry at me, like I've done anything to make her angry at me. She's just so consumed in herself right now. And I don't mean that saying that bad about my daughter. That's how we are as young adults, you know. We get so consumed and our own little concept of what we think life should be, that we totally ignore our father or our mother, right? Our, our parents. And that's what we do in life. We get so consumed in our own ideology of what life should be, we, we just neglect our father. We ne neglect our creator, you know? And we don't want to do that. You know, we want to develop a relationship with, with the Lord. So when you think about a gift, let's go to the Romans 10, 9, and 10, okay? This is kind of how you can receive the gift of God, how you can receive Christ as your Savior. It says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now that part there, believe in thine heart, Right? We as human beings are made up of three parts. We got a physical body, right? It's kind of like our tent that our spirit and our soul is contained in. You know, it's kind of like you going out here and getting a car, and a car would be symbolic of your body, and the car traveling you, uh, transporting you around, right? 
Our spirit and soul is transported around in this body, this fleshful thing that we have that's going to die someday, right? But your spirit, right, when you're born, if you read John chapter 3 when he's talking to uh, Nicodemus, uh, the, Jesus says to Nicodemus that you must be born again, right? What happens is when we're born into this world, we're born as a baby, we have a, like an innocence, right? We get to a certain age, the Jews say like 12 or 13 or something like that. We sin, you know. We become spiritually dead before God. Like our spirit man, our spirit man dies. We're born with a sin nature, but there's a, there's a, there's a point in life where we choose to sin, willfully sin. And that's our spirit man is dead before God. So we walk around this uh, earth in, in our life, and we think we're alive, but we're actually spiritually dead, right? Our soul makes up our mind, will, and emotions, right? And when it says that if we believe in thine heart, that God has raised him from the dead, it's talking about like the core of who you are. It's talking about your inner man, your soul, you know? And if you believe that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, the core of who you are, man believeth on the righteousness. Now here again, notice it doesn't say that man believeth on the righteousness. Man believeth and gets baptized on the righteousness. Man, it doesn't say man believeth on the good works on the righteousness. Man believeth and pay your tithes on the righteousness. Man believeth and feed the hungry on the righteousness. It, it, we, we add all that stuff in there, right? We believe... In our heart, what Christ has done for us, that we're a sinner in need of a Savior, right? We believe that Christ died for our sin and that God raised Him from the dead. And there's a couple of things that happen when God raised Christ from the dead. One is He defeated sin and death. We don't have to live in bondage to sin anymore. That's the other thing that I'm going to be getting to here soon. You know, as you're out talking to people, you realize even people in the church think that sin has some kind of bondage over them. You know, but Jesus Christ defeated sin and death. We don't have to live in bondage to sin. We can be free from it. And not only that, the other, the other reason, there's a few reasons why God raised Christ from the dead, but one is that God was totally satisfied with the payment that Christ paid on your sin debt. Totally satisfied with it. He doesn't want us, He doesn't need us to add anything to it. Do we want to do good works? Yes, we do. Do we want to feed the poor? Yes, we do. Do we want to... Uh, help people? Do we want to go to church? Do we want to get baptized? Of course we do. But it doesn't add to our position in Christ. Okay? And then here it says, with the mouth, confession is made on the salvation. Now going back to where I gave the illustrations of stealing something from Jack or lying to Pastor Jim, you know, there, confessing with the mouth has to do with humbling yourself before God. You know? Like if I want to try to restore the relationship between me and Pastor Jim or, or me and Jack, I have to humble myself and say, Jack, I'm sorry that I stole your trimmers, you know, whatever. And Jim, I'm sorry I lied to you, right? And then we can begin to uh, repair our relationship because I humbled myself enough to admit that, hey, I sinned against you, right? So, you know, uh, this confession with the mouth is... Uh, just confessing to God that we're a sinner in need of a Savior and that we, we're willing to place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. That we believe that He died for our sins and that God raised Him from the dead, you know. And you get people on this kick where they say, well, you know, the, the prayer, you know, really doesn't save anybody. That was developed by the Baptist 200 years ago or whatever, you know. It, it, religion gets on these kicks, you know. But the thing is, the prayer, they're right, the prayer doesn't save anybody. But the prayer is a way to help people confess to God what they believe in their heart. It's just to help them say what they believe. Put it in words that they can get it out there. Okay? What's really saving you is your belief in Christ Jesus. He's saving you. You know? We can't die and stand before God and say, Oh, I prayed that prayer one day. You know? No. We die, we stand before God... I've, and God says, why have I left, why should I leave you in my heaven? And it's because I trusted Jesus Christ for my righteousness, to take my sin away, 
He made me righteous, right? That's what, that's, that's what, that's what our proclamation is. Christ is my only hope. He's my only form of righteousness, you know. I got, I got one. Thanks. Yeah, I'm getting parched. But uh, John 3.36, uh, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not on the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So let's focus on this word half, right? That's a present tense current possession. He that hath the Son hath life. Listen, the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, He currently right now gives you eternal life. You don't have to wait till you die to find out if you have eternal life. It's something that He gives you now. Just like John, 1 John 5, 10, 11, 12, 13, when you read through them scriptures, it says that you can know that you have eternal life. God don't want you walking around life hoping or wondering. He wants you to know, right? And if we trust Google, right? We, we type an address in Google and we want to find somewhere. You know, we're willing to trust our life to Google that we get to the place we want to go, right? And just believe that it's actually taken me to uh, Cameron County or wherever I want to go. We're willing to jump in the car because Google says this is how you get there, right? And we drive there and we get there, and we simply believe that we're where it says we are, right? Because there's some kind of sign there that says uh, Arby's, right? Or, you know, the ball field down in Baltimore. We, we believe that that's where we are because the sign tells us that's where we are, right? And if we're willing to trust Google, why aren't we willing to trust the Word of God? You know, there comes a time in our life where we have to stand on the Word of God and proclaim it and believe it and just don't doubt it, right? So John uh, 5.24 says, Verily, verily I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, there it is again, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, condemnation but is passed from death Unto life. So, one thing there is it says that we have it. Present tense, current possession, everlasting life. Shall not come into condemnation, right? The devil is always trying to beat you up with condemnation. You know? Well, you'll never, you'll, you, you'll never be a minister. You'll never be an evangelist. You'll never be a pastor. Look at your past life, you know? He's always trying to beat you down with condemnation. Listen, if you're getting condemnation about your past, it's not God giving you, condemning you. It's the devil. And if the devil's taking the time to try to beat you up with condemnation, I can guarantee you God's got a call on your life. Right? Right? He, he has a purpose for your life, and the devil's trying to oppress you and keep you from f flourishing in it. Right? So when you get hit with them faults of condemnation, you tell it to get going. Don't be afraid to speak to it as a person because I can guarantee you there's a demonic influence trying to beat you up with it. Just speak right to that thing. Devil, you're a liar. I've been forgiven. That's not who I am. I'm a born-again child of God, forgiven of everything I've ever done. And I am a man of God. And I command you to get out of here in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and return no more. Amen. Speak to that thing. Tell it to get down the road. You know? It don't belong here, right? God has a call and a purpose for everybody in here. And I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the devil says. He's, he's got a call and purpose for you. And don't submit. Don't bow down to this condemnation that you're getting hit with. Don't give the lion teeth. Don't give the lion teeth. That's right. He, he, don't, don't let him suppress you. Rise up against him. Amen. <coughs> Now, one of the other things, uh, I only got a couple of scriptures here, but uh, what time do you usually shut down? I don't know if I'm going too long. Uh, one, one thing we got to realize is scripture, right? Uh, scripture, some scripture speaks to the, the spirit man, and some scripture speaks to the flesh, and some scripture speaks to the soul, right? So, 
2 Corinthians uh, 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. All right? Listen, when you, when you look at history, right, you have people that lived during the Old Testament era, right? They uh, did not have the Spirit of Christ dealing, dwelling in them. The Holy Spirit never dwelled in them. He came upon them at certain seasons for certain reasons, right? Okay? When Christ lived here on earth, right, man still didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in him, right? After Christ died, was resurrected, uh, the, the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost to dwell not beside man, not upon man, but in man, right? So the Holy Spirit was sent to be our comforter. Listen, it's like a new creature, a new creation. It's like something that's never existed before, right? And all, all expand of history, never did the Holy Spirit take place, resonance in a person, right? That's how righteous, right? When you think about God and His righteousness, man can't dwell in the presence of God. But yet here, Jesus does this thing where He, he makes us so righteous that God, in the, in, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, is willing to come dwell inside you, right? Isn't that awesome? Now, now, can you get made any more right than that? In, in the eyes of God? Where He's willing to come dwell in you? Be a part of your actual person? You know, to empower you and to equip you and to give you knowledge and revelation and, and do all these things for you? He wants to work in you and through you. You know? He doesn't want to stand over here and guide your hand around. He doesn't want to stand over here and wait for you to lead him and you know, lead you to do this or do that. He's in you, and you know, the Holy Spirit's actually in you waiting for you to do something so he can exercise his authority and power. It's like a little kid standing in a checkout line with a, with a pack of gum or something, wanting to chomp on that thing, and he can't do it till it's paid for, and it, he can get it out, and it's his, and he can do something with it. It's like the Holy Spirit's inside you wanting to do something, right? He's wanting, to, he's wanting you to pray for people. He's wanting you to share Christ with people. And you know, the minute that you step out to pray for somebody, the minute that you step out to share Christ with somebody, he can exercise his, his authority and his power and his might, right? And change their life, you know? If I don't get up here and speak the Word of God, lives ain't going to be changed, right? He's waiting for me to get up here and speak the Word of God so lives can be changed. You know, it, it, we we got we to gotta do our part. We have, a, we have a role in this. God has allowed us to be an ambassadors of Christ. Everyone's sitting here, right? He wants you to be His ambassador. He wants you to go to the nations, right? However you want to divide that up. There are nations, right? They consider themselves to be nations, okay? There's, there's all kinds of categorized, categories that fall into nations, God wants us to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ to the nations. And the Holy Spirit's in here and He's caged up and He's saying, come on, let's go. Let's go do something, right? Let's go do it. Uh, do I have 2 Corinthians one twenty one on there? Yeah. Okay. For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in Him. So Christ is our righteousness, right? I, all, my, all my good works and acts are, are filthy rags. But Christ makes me righteous. When, Jesus, when God looks at me, He looks at me through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and He sees a righteous man of God standing here in my spirit, right? My spirit is made righteous. It's completely complete. My spirit man can't become any more complete. Your spirit man can't become any more complete, right? But there becomes this renewing of the mind that needs to take place, right? And I'm going to share a scripture with you on that soon, but i got just a couple more. Romans 6, 6 through 14 says, 
We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Now think about that word enslaved, right? You don't do sin. Before you're born again, you're enslaved to sin. Okay? Let's, let's go to the next verse. Oh, you messed up? Well, I'll read it. For one who has died has been set free from sin. It's not necessarily already a messed up. I'll wait until this morning to give him everything. So he kind of rushed around trying to do everything. He's doing pretty good for the last minute thing. Uh, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also must, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Look, we're to consider ourselves dead to sin. So many times we walk around and, and we get this impression that we can't help it. You know, oh, I'm still in the flesh, you know. But Paul says to consider that we are, we're, we're to consider ourselves dead to sin, right? It says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey it in its passions. Let not is a command. You know, we want to brush it off like when, we, when, we, when, we, when we're living in sin, we want to brush it off like, oh, we can't help it, you know. We're, we're not perfect yet. But listen, your spirit man is, com is complete and it's perfect, right? You need to feed your spirit man so it can conquer your flesh, right? If we're, fleeing, if we're feeding our flesh all the time, we're not feeding the spirit man. We're going to be spiritually hindered and we're not going to grow and we're going to live a defeated life. Our flesh is going to, is going to thrive, right? We want to feed the spirit man. So we come to a place where we can, we can the scripture says, let not. It's my decision, right? If I'm going down uh, Eastern Boulevard or whatever it is, and Fat Daddy's is there on the left, and I get this desire to go in there and have a rum and, rum and coke, right? I got a choice to make. Am I going to submit to that desire and go in there? Or am I going to switch my mind? And I'm going to get to that scripture here in a second and keep going, Right? Captain Morgan has no power over me to pull me in there. Christ defeated that desire in me. What's happening is I'm getting hit with a temptation from the devil because he wants to see me fall and live a defeated life so I can't help prosper the kingdom of God. Right? So it says, Do not present your members, which uh, King James says, uh, I think it says uh, body, your body, uh, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. So don't submit your, your hands and your arms and your feet and other body parts to unrighteousness, right? We're not to be living in uh, forn fornication and homosexuality and things. We're not supposed to be living, submitting to these things. We're supposed to control ourselves by the power of God in us, right? So... Uh, but present yourselves to God as those who have been bought, brought from death to life. And your members to God, your body parts to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. So listen, when you're under grace, the divine influence upon your heart, right? Sin won't have dominion over you, right? It can't. The scripture says it can't. Right? So we have no excuse card other than our negligence of feeding our spirit man so we can grow and defeat this stuff. Right? We got we to gotta humble ourselves and, and accept the responsibility that a lot of the things going on in our lives is because we're not willing to submit to the word of God and put it in place in our lives. Live out the word of God. Right? We've got to come to a place where we humble ourselves enough that we're willing to accept that a lot of this mess is our own fault. Right? My, my divorce 
And, you know, that was, a lot of that was my fault. A lot of it was my daughter's mom's fault, right? I got to accept responsibility for that. I can't blame shift her all the time, right? I'd like to, but reality is I, I was imperfect then too. You know, I, I could still make mistakes today. But you know what? Today I have Christ, right? He could help mend them things, right, in a relationship. Especially when both of them are saved. He can help work in that thing, right? So, you got to find my place. So now, now we're getting into a couple of scriptures where uh, we were, in 2 Corinthians we were talking about the spirit man being made perfect, being made righteous in Christ, right? Now the question becomes, how do we get this physical body, how do we get this mind to function in that, in that, in that position, right? Uh, in Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So it's our reasonable service to live a holy life. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay? So I got two more scriptures, but uh, I was thinking about stopping there, but let's, let's, let's just go on. I'll read these quick. Philippians 4, 8 through 9 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good of good report, if there are any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and see in me do and the God of peace shall be with you so when I'm when I'm driving down Eastern Boulevard and I get this thought that I want to go have a Captain Morgan I'm supposed to shift my thinking right I'm supposed to stop thinking about that and start thinking about something else because the scripture says think think on these things uh, we don't have it up there right now but Think on these things, right? So one of the keys of renewing my mind, I want to read the Word, I want to grow in Christ, is so when I get tempted, I can shift my thinking from the pleasures of the world to the pleasures of God, right? And then 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 says, uh, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds, is a uh, mindset that we have that doesn't line up with the Word of God. Okay? So, that's our weapons of our, our warfare. And they're mighty of God, casting down imaginations. Right? So, if, if I'm standing at a checkout line, there's a magazine at the checkout counter that probably is an immoral magazine, and my eye catches it, and my flesh begins to draw towards it, I'm supposed to cast down that imagination. Right? I, have, I, I don't have to submit to it because Christ in me powers me to cast that imagination down and shift my thinking to godly things. But if we're not putting godly things in our minds, we can't shift our thinking, right? So people get saved and they're told that sin has no power over them and they say, well, I tried that and it didn't work for me. Well, you know why it didn't work? Because they didn't renew their mind, right? Right? It's not that it doesn't work. It's that they have a lack of knowledge of how to uh, put the Word of God in action in their life. It's kind of their own fault, but they need to, they need to see that. We need to help them see that. All right? So cast, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Christ has defeated sin, right? We need to take our part and stand on the truth of the Word of God. It's a battle out there, right? Scripture makes it clear that we can stand on these things. We have, we, we have a responsibility to shift our thinking. 
sometimes now these, these things sometimes creep in real slow, real subtle, right? You're getting hit with negative thoughts. You don't even realize you're getting sucked into it, right? Next thing you know, you're speaking things that you shouldn't be speaking. Next thing you find yourself slowly getting sucked into doing things you shouldn't be doing. But the moment that the revelation comes that you're speaking things you shouldn't be speaking, the moment the revelation comes that, you know, you're flipping through the TV and you're, you're watching a show and all of a sudden they're promoting uh, homosexuality or something, you can say, wow, I got sucked into this. And then you can, you can say, hey, no more, right? Turn the TV off. Pick up your Bible. Flip to God TV or something. Watch that, you know? Uh, we are to cast these vain imaginations down and stand on the Word of God and allow Christ to get the victory that He paid for. Because right now, truth in America, in Christianity, Christ is getting robbed. He's getting robbed. He paid for a lot more, right, than what we see happening here in America. And if we don't proclaim these truths, Christ isn't going to get what He's paid for. The devil's, the, every, every soul the devil takes to hell, he stole from Christ, right? We need to get them back. Christ, you know, he, he actually uh, is dependent on us to help get them back. He wants to be a part of working with us to help get them back, you know? So let's do that, right? So let's stop letting the devil defeat us because of a lack of knowledge, Right? If you don't have a desire to read every day, ask the Lord to give you a desire. Just be honest with Him. Lord, I don't feel like reading the Word. Lord, I don't feel like going to church. Lord, I don't feel like watching Christian TV. I don't feel like uh, listening to Christian music. He knows your heart. So just humble yourself and tell it to Him. God, I need you to help change me. Instead, when we, what, what happens is when we don't feel like reading the Word and we don't feel like listening to Christian music, when we don't feel like watching Christian TV, when we don't feel like coming to church and doing Christian godly things, the devil slips in, starts condemning us, beating us down, and we get to the point where we just give up, right? Because somehow we feel unworthy to God because he knows that how we're feeling. I had a guy tell me one time years ago, he says, he was cussing in church, right? And it's like, what are you doing cussing in church? He's like, well, God knows my heart, so I might as well just be who I am, even when I'm in church, right? But the thing that he was missing was, right, the devil can put this stuff in your head, right? Let me give you an example of that. I think it was, it was Peter when uh, Christ asked, who do they say I am, right? He says, uh, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, blessed are you, for these things have been revealed to you by God and not a man, right? And then a couple of verses later, uh, Christ is talking about being crucified. And Peter says, oh no, that ain't going to happen to you. And Christ says to Peter, he says, get thee behind me, Satan, for those faults are not of God but of man, right? So there's a, there, there's a perfect example that, you know, we have our own fault system, right? The devil can put faults in our head, and God can put faults in our head. So if we don't read the Word of God, we don't know who's speaking to us, right? we got to line everything up to the Word of God. If I'm getting a fault, I need to compare it to the Word of God so I can live a victorious life. If it doesn't line up with the, with the Word of God, I need to cast that vain imagination down and not act on it, okay? You have the power to do it, amen? We just got to start exercising that authority and that power and read the Word of God so we're not destroyed by the lack of knowledge. So we can grow spiritually and help other people grow spiritually. Amen? And that's, that's all I got. Uh, can you throw up the Celebrate Recovery picture? <laughs>